Well, hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. I know a lot of you guys are coming in from all over the planet, so thank you very much for uh, having patience with us and attending today's session. Uh, I know several of you have been waiting around here for 30 minutes or more as we got ready, and also we wanted to kick off at the right time. I'm already receiving some emails and tweets for people trying to get into the session. One interesting question we've already received was, hey, can my uh, iPad work? Well, I just tested that, and it turns out the iPad uh, version of the WebEx um, app does not quite work for what we're trying to do here today. So bear that in mind if you're, trying to, if you're busily trying to get your iPad working right now. I could not make it work, and that's because this is an event center um, presentation which is a little bit different than what, what is a typical meeting center. Uh, so in other words, we, we primarily are presenting to you instead of an interactive meeting. So we'll have to, we'll have to look into that for a future. Um, so let's get started. So if you look here, this is our developer series. We do this, and it says the first and third every Wednesday, but we're going to probably knock it back to just the third Wednesday of the month. That's mostly for my personal sake. Way too busy. Right now we're running up to JBoss World and JudCon. If you're not going to be in Boston with us here in two weeks, uh, the first week of May, um, that's unfortunate because we're going to have some great, great content. Now the good news is we're going to take a lot of those speakers and their presentations and demonstrations and we're going to put them back through our webinar series. So all that stuff that's happening at JBoss World related to App Server 7 or even stuff that's going on with Hibernate OGM or um, things that are happening with the Enterprise Service Bus, Switchyard, you know, pick your favorite JBoss project. We're talking about it, you know, to rules, JVPM, et cetera. We're talking about it at JetCon and JBoss World. We're going to get those guys to come back for us and, and give us a presentation here in the webinar series also. So we'll probably drop down to about third Wednesdays. Just keep in mind, we'll, we'll send you emails if you're already on our email list. Uh, we'll also try to keep the web page updated. I know I've been doing a poor job of that lately. I apologize, but we'll, we'll keep it going. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter at JBoss Developer. Uh, so don't forget about the email list. Most of you here probably received an email from me. And when you do guys, if you do respond, I try to respond back. And forgive me if I'm a little bit late on that. I normally get two or 3,000 bounce backs for vacation notices. So we, we get those emails out there and let you know what's happening. Pretty much these webinars are announced through this channel. And we also send out our JBoss Developer Newsletter, which comes out from Mark Little and announces all, uh, all the different happenings with our projects, like the fact that Rich Faces 4 is now available, Scene 3 is now available. Uh, those kind of things are definitely flowing through that system. So bear that in mind. All right, so here we are. Uh, and I just have a couple of the historical items there, January, February, March, et cetera. We're now April 20th, and we're running with Hibernate 4 and Steve Ebersol. Okay? So we also have May 18th. Uh, that's the Scene 3 presentation with Shane, the project lead for Scene. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the Scene project, of course, it's where we actually incubate new extensions to the Java EE programming model. A lot of what you see in Java EE 6, specifically CDI, uh, Context Dependency Injection, came out of that Scene 3 project team and the efforts there in that community. And so that project has recently gone final and is available at jboss.org. So there's a lot of interesting content to see there, including new extensions that go well beyond Java EE 6 and lead us into Java EE 7. And looking forward, I know most people have yet to adopt EE6, but we're already moving to the next generation. And Drool's Planner, if you guys have not had a chance to check out Drool's project lately, um, the videos the team has produced, the demonstrations are absolutely amazing. And Drool's Planner is a pretty interesting project. So we have the guy who's directly responsible for that who's going to give us a nice presentation on that one. Uh, we're also talking, like I said, to the guys with JudCon and JBoss World. We're going to get some AS7 content. AS7 is imminent. If you guys haven't been watching jboss.org on that topic, I encourage you to do so. App Server 7 is a fundamentally new architecture, um, and it, is, it is, falls in the wicked cool category. We're talking application servers that start in a few seconds, less than 10, like 3, 2, uh, as well as dynamic lazy loading of your services based on what you need. You only pay for what you, what you need kind of thing. A uh, lot of... A lot of capability there, including multi-server management, what we call domain management, a lot of neat stuff happening in the AS7 world. So I encourage you to check that out. So we're going to get some sessions on that. And then any other of our project leads or people within the JBoss core community, if they're interested in talking, we, we will try to set up a session and get that going. Okay? Um, one thing we should note is that we very much in these this series of webinars, uh, the ones that are sponsored by me and, and handled by our JBoss core team like Steve here, um, we, we are very much focused on the community side of the equation. So that's the jboss.org 
uh, the projects that we maintain or manage or projects that we invest in heavily, and that includes projects where we contribute to, like the Eclipse Project. We contribute to Glassfish. We contribute to uh, Apache. We contribute, obviously, to Hibernate. You know, so there's all these other technologies and open source projects that you're probably aware of we make contributions to, uh, and any of our core team members are eligible to come up and speak on those topics in this particular series. Um, so just bear that in mind. We're focused on the community side. The enterprise side, of course, is where we harden the, those various open source projects, gather them all together, incubate them for a long period of time so that we know they work together, they're certified together, they operate um, well across many operating systems, JVMs, databases, et cetera. All that testing, QA work, and productization effort happens on the enterprise side, and that's because we have to offer you know, 24 by 7 support uh, for many, many years on top of that on top of that application server platform or portal or uh, SOA platform, et cetera. So just bear that in mind. We're focused on the leading edge and the community side, the enterprise side we don't focus on, but there's plenty of content for that out there at jboss.com. And of course, there's a webinar series that focuses more on that side as well. All right. Um, this is the slide I've been using now for a while, but just bear in mind, JBoss World's coming up first week in May. There's a, it's um, preceded with JudCon, which is a $99 event. If you're in the Boston area or if you can get there on a cheap plane ticket, I encourage you to do so. We have two days of JudCon, Monday, Tuesday. And the team that's presenting later in the week for JBoss World is even there for JudCon. And we have a whole bunch of other core developers that will be participating. This is a small partial list of folks that will be participating, like Max Anderson with JBoss Tools, Manuel Bernard, who's also uh, working with the Hibernate Project, uh, Mac, Mike Brock, who's got this uh, Array project or Array project that extends Google Web Toolkit. Um, we're doing some stuff around HTML5. We're doing stuff on InfiniSpan. We're doing stuff with Ridge Faces. Um, there's a lot of great content that's coming out. But we will make an effort to get that through this webinar channel as well. Because I know many of you folks coming in from Asia, coming in from Europe, you know, it would be hard to get here in Boston in two weeks. Okay? So today, Steve, Steve has the lead of the Hibernate project. And, you know, you guys are very familiar with the Hibernate project. There's hundreds of people on the line today. So I'm sure many of you guys have used it now for years uh, extensively, and you're going to have some great questions for Steve. Um, and he's going to really focus today and, and deep dive and give us a, uh, some information on what's happening in the future, what's coming, what's interesting, and uh, what the roadmap looks like. And I think you guys will enjoy the session. And this is going to be uh, a great session to ask a lot of questions. Steve likes to get a lot of questions. Please pound us with questions in the Q&A panel on the lower right-hand side. It says Q&A. You just type in your question, okay, and then we're going to try to get to those as quickly as possible. Uh, Steve, you might, if you see them pop up in line and you want to address them, feel free to do so. Otherwise, I'll kind of be mentally queuing them up, and I'll help you organize them towards the end. Um, and then also, there's the chat. You can chat with our, our panelists. And then if you're in any technical difficulties, uh, please reach out to our WebEx producer there in the chat to ask about, you know, things like phone numbers or, you know, can't see, can't hear, that kind of stuff, all right? But otherwise, we have hundreds of you here today, and already I'm sure some of you guys are eager and ready to listen in. So let's make Steve the presenter, get things flipped over here, and Steve, you're ready to go. All right, sounds great. Thanks, Burr. Um, yeah, as Burr, as Burr mentioned, I, you know, I, I do prefer um, getting, getting questions and things like that. I'm, I, you know, I like to be a little bit more interactive. Um, but I did, did um, you know, put together some, some slides and some, some material to kind of go through um, up front so we can, you know, take a look at some of the stuff happening in Hibernate 4.0, but also take a look at, you know, what's going, to, going on moving forward as well. Um, so I am, my name is Steve Ebersaw, you know, I'm the lead developer of Hibernate. Um, so a couple of things that are going on um, specifically with Hibernate 4.0 first that I wanted to take a look at. Um, you know, here we have an overview of the high-level kinds of things um, going on that you'll see, as, uh, you know, from an end-user perspective or from a, a developer perspective, um, and we'll we'll talk about um, these in more detail on the on the following slides. But um, so let's let's kind of get into those. But I just wanted to have a you know a, a grouping of them first. All right. Uh, the first thing is. Um, the introduction of something called services. Hibernate's always sort of had this notion, um, but this is more a formalization of that. Um, basically, it's stuff that that Hibernate internally consumes um, to you know to do certain things. So, for example, um, you know a, a real you know well-known one, I guess, is dialect. You know, dialect uh, you know is not 
uh, has not been made a service yet, but I'm just talking about in terms of the types of, of function that it serves. Um, you know, something like a connection provider, which is how Hibernate goes out and gets, um, you know, JDBC connections when it needs it, um, actually is a service. Um, so it's things that, you know, again, that are, that are consumable by Hibernate. Um, the notion of services is extendable, so you can actually plug in your own. Um, this might be really useful if you're doing a lot of, like, say, for example, custom event listeners in Hibernate. Um, you might want to plug in your own service. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, a little bit later exactly what that gets you. Um, but you might want to plug in your own custom services. So this is something that goes beyond the standard set of Hibernate services. Um, additionally, you can also override them. So, for example, I mentioned the uh, connection provider. You know, if, for example, you're actually going to have, um, you know, a custom approach for getting connections, you might want to plug in your own connection provider. This is, you know, something that used to be doable in Hibernate as well. Before you had to set um, a configuration parameter, and it had to be the name of a class, and then Hibernate would go out and instantiate it. And I think, you know, that kind of illustrates the, the difference in, in Hibernate 4 with services in general. You know, it's just a, a much more fluent way to, um, to configure it. So, you know, now you'd be able to, um, you know, we'll take a look at, at initiators later, but you'd be able to specify, you know, here's an initiator, so here's how we're going to instantiate that class and, and go out and do things. You can actually plug in the, um, you know, the instance of the connection provider that you want to use. Um, so it's a little bit more, more of a fluid API. Um, so as, you know, as, as somebody that might want to leverage services, what, what does that actually get you? Well, it gets you a well-defined set of lifecycle um, callbacks. You know, it's very similar to a lot of things you see out there, whether it be CDI or, um, you know, JMX or, you know, any of those kinds of things that give you, you know, sort of um, lifecycle things. So in, in the Hibernate services, you can get callbacks for things like, you know, I, I need to initialize myself, I need to start and stop myself, I need to, um, you know, the next one we see is, is um, you know, getting injected with dependencies. So, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to, um, to receive my dependencies. Um, those kinds of things um, are built into that whole notion of a service registry which is, um, you know, the way that services are, are grouped together and, and you interact with them. Um, I gave a link here. This, this is an older sort of link, but it's the original design. Um, it's a wiki that I, that I wrote up originally to kind of spec out what services would look like and what the service registry would look like. It's a little bit outdated in terms of, you know, specific details. But in general, you know, the general concept and the general notions are all still very valid. Um, so I wanted to, you know, to link that so you can kind of see, you know, where it grew from and, 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 uh, and you know, and, and some examples of it. Uh, this has been, you know, we're, we're actually on um, Alpha, Alpha 2 right now. We're working on Alpha 3, which is scheduled to be released the first Wednesday in May. Um, the services part of it's actually been it's been an incubation for a really long time. This is code that, that we've been working on um, for, you know, well over a year. But this was, you know, actually put in place in the very first alpha, um, but, you know, it's, it's much older than that. So this is, you know, a stable API. This is, um, you know, the set of calls that you would do um, to build up a services registry. So here we see an example of an initiator. So like I said, you know, this would be an example of an extension. You know, I'm going to plug in, a, you know, a brand new service that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe I'm using from my event listener or something like that. Um, so that's how you would, you would add one. Um, you know, here we have a specific service, um, you know, plugging in a brand new connection provider. So that's going to override the standard way that Hibernate would go out and build a connection provider. And you're telling it exactly, you know, here's what I want you to do when, when you need connections. Um, and then you build a service registry. And we'll see on the next slide exactly how that, how that translates then into building, um, you know, into building a session factory. Um, uh, the, the, another, the next piece is building the meta model. So this is the, the configuration time representation of all of your, you know, your domain classes, your database, and the binding in between those two. Um, 
you know, we, we went back and, and just totally redid all that. This is actually stuff that's still actively under development. Um, so it's still still going on and still kind of evolving as, as you know, as we speak today even. Um, the big changes are changes in semantic. I mean, there's, there's obviously, you know, API changes as well, but much different semantics for this. You know, previously, in previous versions of Hibernate, you, would had, you had this thing called a configuration, and you would, you know, instantiate a configuration, and you would throw, you know, a bunch of properties at it and, and a bunch of, you know, you know URLs to, to mapping resources and, and annotated classes. You would just throw all this stuff together without any, you know, predefined order, without any rhyme or reason, and then ask it to build you a session factory. Um, you know, one of the design goals of Hibernate 4 was to make that process a little bit more directed, um, specifically to the point where, you know, when you were doing certain steps, you would, you know, you would know that the stuff that you needed was already available. So, for example, you know, the, the real big thing here was stuff like, um, you know, being able to know the dialect, the database that you're talking to when you're building up the meta model. Um, this is important because you might want to, you know, transparently be able to handle um, keyword quoting, or, you know, how does how does this database deal with, you know, long string data, for example? You know, does it does it understand clobs? Does it need, you know, some other variant? Does it need an OID? You know, all, all these types of things are really good to know when you're building up this meta model. But in previous versions of Hibernate, you couldn't do all that information, or we couldn't do that information because, you know, the dialect might not have been set yet. Um, so that was a design goal up front. We wanted to make sure that you knew, that we knew the information we needed when we were processing stuff so that we could, you know, make more informed decisions internally. Um, all sources are known up front in this new meta model. So you see down here at, at, at the bottom the little code snippet, the example, um, we have a new class called Metadata Sources. Um, and, and you can see we're passing in the services registry. So there we see the first usage of that. But we build up this metadata sources, and the methods are pretty much the same as the methods that used to be on configuration for defining sources of metadata. So, you know, we're adding a, adding a resource. So this is the ones that used to go out, and they still do, um, go out and do class path lookups for a resource of that name. Um, we're also adding an annotated class, so we can mix and match just like we used to be able to. Um, you know, we're building up this metadata source. Once we have the metadata source built up, then we can ask it to build a metadata. And this is going to be, you know, really similar to, you know, if, if any of you all used to do the, um, you know, build up the configuration and then ask it for, for the persistent classes, um, like the root class and the subclass and all that kind of stuff, so you could, you know, either alter it or use it in some way. This is going to give you that capability as well. So once you get this metadata, you know, you'll be able to ask it for, um, you know, an entity by name and, and get, you know, a representation of that and, and mutate it if you need to or, you know, use it some way. And then, you know, and this is all, this is all proposed at, at this point, by the way. Um, this is not set in stone. This is just, you know, a, a proposal that was made to the, um, to the development list and, and, uh, and it's something that's, that's actively being discussed right now. Um, but from the metadata, then you, then you would build the session factory. Um, personally, I like the approach because it's very, you know, it, it's directed. You know, it, it, it kind of directs you as, as a developer that's using the API. You know, here's exactly how I do stuff. You know, here's the order in which I do it, which I, which I really like. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that's changed is the way that you create um, sessions. Um, you know, previously, Previously, we used to have a bunch of overloaded methods. I mean, I, I forget exactly the number. It was up to it was up to like you know 15 to 20 methods on the session factory to open sessions, depending upon what you know what parameters you wanted to pass in, um, which was really you know a, a cluttered API. And we wanted to to really address that um, to simplify it quite a bit. So we looked at you know there's typically two main reasons. Or yeah, two main reasons that you would open a session. Uh, you know, the first is you've got a, you know, you have the session factory and you want to open your main session. 
you know, so that's that's the the, the typical use case. Um, and so, and then the other one is, you know, I've got a session and I need to open up a secondary session, um, you know, to do some work, you know, like so for example, if I've got a, uh, you know, an audit log or something like that, um, you know, you, you'd want to open it up with certain pieces of information from the session, um, with, from the, the, the main session. So something like, you know, the, uh, um, the connection that it's using, the JWC connection that it's using, so on and so forth. So we decided to, to, to use a builder style, um, and we see, we see examples of usages of that in both, you know, both manners. So from a session factory, there's a method called with options that returns you a, a builder. You can specify the information that you want to use to build the session, and then finally, once you get it all set up, then you would, um, then you would say open session. Um, if you say session dot session with options, um, you know that's intending to open a, a brand new session with some some options. Um, so you have the same exact um, methods that are available to you in the session factory with options object. So you can say use this specific interceptor, but we see an overloaded form of that here where we say just interceptor without any parameters, which is saying use the the same interceptor as on the original session. Um, and there's a, a bunch of those types of methods as well. And then finally, you you open the session, so it it cleans it up quite a bit, um, makes it makes it nice and fluent. And there's um, and we kept like the most common one or two methods on session factory as well. Um, so you know session factory dot open session, no parameters. Um, you know the, a method like that remains. I, I can't remember exactly which ones we ended up keeping, but. Um, So, Burr, I saw that there was, there was some questions. Did you want me to, to address some of these now? Yeah, there's actually, because some of them are topical, like uh, if you talk about services, there was a specific question about services. Okay. Um, if you want to well, flip back to the slide, and it's related to dependency injection and IOC, like spring, juice, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Have you thought through integration points, you know, to the spring world or what's going on with CDI? With, with yeah, the I, I no, but being at, at JBoss and, and, and knowing, you know, obviously everybody that works on Seam, um, you know, that was the big thing was was trying to think through CDI. Um, it's just not, you know, I, personally I couldn't really come up with a good way to do that in a in, in a in a really basic kind of way that was usable in any number of environments. And so basically, what you know, what I ended up deciding on that was uh, most of it's interface driven and as you know individual use cases come up then you know we would plug in you know well here's how you would do that in CDI so that you could you know you know leverage because it's definitely something that we want to be able to, to take advantage of you know have some you know seam or CDI class or bean that you want to inject um, into a service, you know that that kind of stuff is would be really really useful. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll we definitely like to do that, but it won't be it won't be part of the core services stuff. Um, but we will, you know, potentially add some of that stuff later. And one point to be made for a lot of folks, we have a large crowd on the phone today, and I suspect not everyone's heard of CDI just yet. And CDI, of course, is your, your, the standardization of dependency injection that you saw in Spring, you saw it in Juice, you saw it in Seam. Now there's a standard version of that, and there's a reference implementation out there called Weld that we sponsor and have provided that to the market. So if you look for Weld, W-E-L-D, that is the reference implementation for CDI. And you can take that today, load it on to a JBoss container, or it's actually in JBoss 6. Um, and it's also, you can be used with Tomcat, even, or Glassfish. It is the reference implementation for Glassfish also. So I encourage you guys to check that one out, and maybe you can start exploring where injection might give us some better ease of use, you know, with the services concept that Steve was talking to. I guess we can always check the, uh, the, the entity manager, <laughs> right? Say again? I'm, I'm sorry, I was looking through uh, the Q&A. So. Oh, everybody can always inject the entity manager. That seems to be one uh, of the... Right, right. Um, okay, so I'm going to... Was there any... Did you notice any questions about um, the meta model or, or the session creation? 
I'm looking now. There's a lot of great questions. But, um, will older APIs for Hibernate session creation still work? So backward compatibility question. No. No. The whole point was to, to clean that up. Okay. So, Emma, hopefully you got that answer and you feel strongly one way or another. Feel free to ask another question. Um, I noticed one about JPA. Um, do you know if the JPA spec will be updated to include 4.0, uh, Hibernate 4.0 features? Um, there's, so specifically, the question was regarding stateless sessions and user types. Um, stateless sessions, no, I've not heard any, any talk about that. Um, user types, pretty much every, you know, every provider has something similar, uh, you know, some kind of pluggable, you know, column level type mapping. So yes, there has been talk about a, um, a portable way to define those. Um, it, it's really, you know, it's really difficult because most, you know, uh, like for example, you know, a lot of, a lot of providers will, will do, um, you know, the mapping to JDBC based on um, parameter index, you know, so set, set string, you know, here's the parameter position. Hibernate and, and, and maybe some others. I don't. I don't, I'm not sure exactly of, of the, the low, lower level details in all the providers. But Hibernate actually uses column names, um, so it says set string. You know, some column alias. So things like that are really hard to overcome in a spec, um, where you've got like you know a really disparate kind of kind of difference there. Um, but there is there is a planned um, 2.1 or you know, a, a, a set of discussions around um, JPA 2.1 that would have um, you know, some, some additional features. And Steve, there are a number uh, over, you know, kind of just overview kind of questions uh, that we can get to later, or we can kind of get to now. If you uh, would like to the session to yeah, cover those. Let's, let's go ahead and, and, uh, and, and get through the next couple of, of slides, and then we'll come, come back to the, uh, to the general kind of questions. Very good. But yeah, please please stop me if you notice any more topical sort of sort of Q and A. Um, multi tenancy. I'm not going to go too deeply into this because we did a an entire webinar on this um, previously. Um, I listed here the URL to a wiki page I started that has you know links to a bunch of resources, um, some of the Q and A that we did um, as part of that uh, webinar. Um, Basically, you know, at, at a high level, multi-tenancy is you have different sets of data that you're running through the same application deployment. Um, you typically, you've got three approaches to doing it. You've got separate schemas, um, separate databases, so physical database machines are separate, um, and then support for uh, or discrimination-based. So you've got some discriminator column in your you know in your tables that that identifies what tenant. Um, the data that row belongs to. Um, so we have support, the API is there. Um, we have you know, support for the schema-based um, schema based implementation, the, the database, separate database-based implementation. And we will do also do discrimination-based. That's just not done yet. Um, and I, I'm not sure if it'll get into 4.0, or it may have to do with um, it may have to wait till 4.1. We'll see um, exactly what kind of time crunch we get into for that. Um, but it's definitely planned and, and will be either 4.0 or 4.1. Um, regarding, so there's a question, multiple distributed databases. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what that, that means. Um, basically, you've got the same exact database you know, set of tables and so on and so forth um, in either different databases or in different schemas. Um, they just happen to represent, you know, different cust you know, data for different customers. You know, you're a, you're a, um, you know, a, a service provider, and uh, you know, you've got, you host data for different customers, but it's the same application. Um, so that's that's the kind of thing. Um, and yes, the caching stuff is all taken care of. Um, you know, so whether it's part of the session cache, whether it's part of the second level cache, whether it's part of the query caching, all that stuff recognizes tenants, the tenant ID. 
we'll see we'll see an example. Oh, actually, no, I guess I didn't put that in here. Um, the tenant ID is actually specified as part of that new um, that new session creation API. Just going back really quick in the, in the, in the, uh, the slide deck. Um, session factory dot with options. You'd say something like dot tenant identifier and set the identifier for you know for the that you want to use for that particular session. Um, it has to be specified up front, and you can't change it um, while you're working in that particular session for security reasons, obviously. Um, anyway, so that's the uh, you know the API for that. Um, logging. Okay, so yes, yet another logging framework. I think this is our our third one in four major releases. Um, you know, we we switched to um, SLF4J, I think back in 3.5, and now we're moving to JBoss logging. Um, if you look at the the link there on that last bullet point, um, you will notice that uh, if you if you go to that link, you'll notice a bunch of um, you know, a bunch of reasons why we're doing that. I just listed some of them here. Um, the first one is that we've got keyed messages, you know, so support for key, uh, message keys, um, which is useful for um, troubleshooting sort of, uh, you know, sort of things. Like we want to put in the documentation, you know, if you see this particular message key, either in an exception or in the logging, um, here's where you, you know, here, you can go to the, the documentation and see, Okay, look up that key, and it'll give you a, a description of what, as well as you know what commonly causes that. Um, so it's a it's a documentation um, help in that particular way. Um, also, JBoss logging has built-in support for internationalization. Um, so um, you know we can internationalize the messages as well as the, the log messages as well as the exception messages um, through um, J, you know this JBoss logging framework. Um, so both both pretty big wins. Um, so we decided to make to make the switch there, and it's 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 a wrapper. So you know behind the scenes, it actually you know bridges to a number of different implementations. I think out of the box, it supports. Um, you know, I think it can bridge to SLF4J even, which you know, I'm not sure how useful that is because that in, the, in and of itself is a wrapper. But it can it can bridge to um, um, Log4J. And it can also bridge to um, JDK logging. Um, so some, some flexibility there in terms of what you're actually doing um, on the back end in terms of, of logging, which was you know, obviously still important. Um, package changes. So again, we've, you know, just like we did when we went from Hibernate 2 to Hibernate 3, um, we're taking this opportunity to change some packages around. Um, and, and it's two reasons for this. Um, the first one is we're preparing for OSGI support, um, and this it won't be in, in 4.0 um, out, outside of the, the specific changes that we're making right now. Um, but you know we're preparing for that um, specifically by splitting up stuff based on the intended target or you know the intended user of those APIs. So we're making a, a you know what seems to be a pretty typical split. We're splitting stuff into API packages. Um, we're splitting stuff out into SPI packages, which are service provider interfaces. So if you write low-level integrations with Hibernate, um, you know, those are the, the interfaces and, and stuff that you would use, the SPIs. And then we also have an internal package. Um, so we're splitting stuff out into those three different things. Internal is you know, it, it just intended for Hibernate use. It's not really intended for you know, usage either as integrations or for uh, you know, public APIs. Wherever possible, we are keeping um, the API packages in the same namespace. So, for example, session obviously is a, a public API, um, and rather than have an API package, we're actually just keeping that in org.hibernate. So, you know, you know, wherever possible, the API is still just you know the same package that that it used to be in. Hey, Steve, I noticed a couple questions related to logging has come in. Um, is, and one question I have, is this the same logging framework that we're proposing for JBoss AS, and is, or is it yet another logging framework beyond the JBoss AS one that's new? No, no, it's the same one. Um, so this is, it all ties together. Um, 
And uh, if you go to that, that link that's in there, um, you know, you'll you get some more details about it. Uh, I also noticed, can the JBoss logger be used in other app containers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just a jar file. Um, it, it's you know not a big deal. It's just like uh, you know just like if you were to have F SLF for J. I mean you'd have your JBoss logging jar and then you'd have whatever backend you wanted to use. So if you wanted to use JBoss logging with log for J, you'd have both of those jar files. And that's you know just like you would with SLF for J. You can use it anywhere you want. That was obviously another big you know another big requirement for for us because we do run in in other other containers and app servers. Um, the other reason for package, the package name change was self-documentation. So, in other words, um, you know, a lot of times there's, you know, we'll get, um, we'll get, you know, either questions on the forums or um, bug reports in Jira about, hey, you know, there's some, you know, I tried using this, you know, this class directly and I got bugs against it, and we wanted to, like, you know self-document that the fact that that's not really intended for you to use. So if, you know, stuff's in an internal package that's not for your consumption as, as a developer, um, you know, that's just strictly for Hibernate use. If it's, th you know, if it's causing problems the way Hibernate's using it, yeah, absolutely, we have to fix it. But, you know, if, it's, if you're trying to use it in your application and it's causing problems, that's not necessarily something we're really going to be too worried about. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a little bit of self-documentation, um, which is always nice. And then I also collected together um, just some links for different, um, you know, different resources. The first one is a wiki for, you know, it's dedicated to this, this webinar. Um, so, for example, things like, um, you know, resources. I put the, uh, the slide deck up there. I put, you know, if we get questions out there, I'll, you know, I'll keep an eye on that thing for a while, and, and we'll try to answer questions out there. Um, so just, you know, like I said, just a, a, a wiki that, that's kind of centered around this webinar. Um, the second one, and I think this is actually linked in the, uh, the webinar wiki, um, is another wiki that is the, um, the migration guide for 4.0. So if you're migrating from 3.6 to 4.0, um, you know, this is a, a work in progress of things that you're, you're going to have to change or that will have to change in that migration. Um, Additionally, uh, Hibernate, the Hibernate Dev mailing list, um, you know, if you've got, you know, if you want to help out with, uh, with the Hibernate 4 development, if you, you know, have ideas about Hibernate 4 development, um, you know, you can, you can subscribe to that mailing list, and that's where we do the discussion. Um, we also do a lot of discussion on our IRC channel, which is kept on, you know, it's through Freenode, and it is... Um, the Hibernate Dev channel. Um, you have to be registered. You have to be a registered user with Freenode to join. Um, but um, anyway, so there's some additional information, some different ways to to discuss Hibernate Four um, with us. Um, so let's see, 4.0 scalability testing um, or testing in relation to 4.0. Um, yeah, we already have we already have 4.0 set up on our on our um, Hudson, or whatever it's called nowadays, uh, continuous integration testing. Um, so 4.0 is set up with that. Um, we're already testing it as part of, um, you know, the app server for, um, you know, for, for, for uh, EE certification and things like that, um, making sure it works as, as a J, JPA provider with, with JBoss. Um, all that kind of stuff's going on, yeah. And I, and I think there's a couple questions related to JPA, and that's come up as a little bit of a theme in the Q&A section. Um, could you, and I remember I asked you this question too, a while back, Steve. Can you speak to the advantages of using Hibernate with, you know, Azure JPA provider, but what are some of the things over and above JPA um, that someone might take advantage of, even Hibernate 3 or Hibernate 4? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'll just talk, I mean, I'll just talk general generalities first. Um, using Hibernate, uh, uh, you know, again, sort of as opposed to JPA. Um, you know, JPA is a spec, it, like any other spec. It's you know, to a large extent, it's you know, what I, the, the term I always like to use is least common denominator. You know, it's it's you know, ba basically a bunch of vendors are sitting around trying to say, well, we've got you know, this idea for a commonality, you know, a common set of 
of stuff between all of our products, um, you know, and, and do that as a spec so people can, you know, move between them. So, you know, but of course they're all voting on what features get included. So, you know, if, you know, if somebody asks, uh, you know, Hibernate, hey, you know, let's add this feature that Hibernate doesn't support, you know, of course we're going to fight against that because, you know, it's work we have to do. Um, you know, same with, with Oracle, same with any of them, right? So there's always a, a least common denominator sort of, sort of thing going on with specs. Um, so, you know, the first generality there is that, you know, Hibernate's got more stuff than JPA. Um, that's, you know, generally true of any of the JPA providers. They have more stuff going on than, than JPA does. Um, some specifics with Hibernate um, that are really kind of useful um, and or cool over JPA. Um, you know, JPA, for example, defines, um, you know, when fetching happens. You know, so if you talk about fetch strategies, um, you know, JPA defines that, you know, well, data is, you know, you have to get associated data now or you have to get it later, but it doesn't ever describe how. You know, it doesn't ever let the developer describe how you go get the data. So, you know, you go get it, you know, you go get it now. Okay, well, does that mean that I join it? So do I do, I do a join fetch or do I do a separate select? Do I do a select fetch? Um, there's a big performance implication there, and JPA just kind of glosses over that and, and leaves it up to the developer or leaves it up to the implementation, I'm sorry. Um, you know, and, and lots of stuff like that. You know, Hibernate's got a, a, a really expans expansive set of uh, fetching strategies, so, you know, things like sub-select fetching, batch fetching, you know, all these different types of things that you can do that JPA just doesn't, um, you know, it, it doesn't ever really address. And so it's left up to, you know, to the, the actual implementation, Hibernate, to decide what to do but if you, the developer, wants to do it, you know, or to leverage those things, then you have to fall back to um, proprietary APIs. So you have to actually attach, you know, Hibernate specific annotations and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's a that's a big thing. Um, caching is another one. You know, it defines the fact that, you know, stuff's cached in a second level cache, but it never defines how. You know, what are the semantics of that caching? Um, you know, is it is it a you know, a transactional cache? Is it, um, you know, what, you know, all these different kind of access strategies that Hibernate defines it doesn't ever really address. So those are, uh, you know, those are important distinctions as well. Um, some other things, you know, like, you know, some people are asking about user types. I mean, Hibernate user types are, are really, really powerful. Um, so that's another thing that JPA um, doesn't really um, address. Um, anyway, so th those are the, those are the kinds of things that uh, that I see as as you know, Hibernate providing beyond JPA. I'm not going to, I guess, go into all of them. But um, so, what other questions? One couple questions that I'm sure is on everybody's mind is uh, what version of Hibernate? When is Hibernate four showing up in JBoss AS, or what version of JBoss AS do you anticipate seeing Hibernate four? And then the other would be approximate time frame for Hibernate 4. Um, well, up through beta is already scheduled out um, in JIRA. Um, the beta, beta 1 is scheduled for June 1st. Um, I think that was the date. It was the first, it was the first Wednesday in, in June. I think it's June 1st. Um, and then beyond beta, um, you know, we'll have, to, we'll have to obviously see how the betas go um, in terms of getting bug reports in and things. Um, in terms of JBoss AS, um, the, it, it'll be seven. The question is, you know, it, it won't make probably the 7.0 um, cutoffs, the dates for uh, 7.0. Uh, so it'll probably be, you know, there, and there's discussion of will it be a 7.01 or 7.1 or, or something like that, but it'll be, you know, some, some kind of follow-up to JBoss 7.0. There's one interesting question in here. Um, is there any special concerns about clustering databases or clustered databases? Do you have any thoughts on clustered databases and Hibernate's interaction with them? Um, 
Well, I mean, that's if you're talking about, I, I guess you have to clarify what exactly is meant there. If you're talking about the clustering to where, you know, it's handled at the JDBC level, um, there's not really much that you have to do. I mean, the JDBC layer is taking care of all that. Um, if you're talking about like some kind of soft clustering, um, you know, no, Hibernate doesn't really deal with that. I mean, that's kind of the use case for for um, to, for shards to an extent. Um, but there's all kinds of you know additional semantics above and beyond the database with that. Um, you know, when you start using something like shards. So it, it, it kind of depends on, on what you mean by clustered. If, if it's, again, if it's something like physical clustering of the database, that's usually handled either by the DBMS or the JDBC level, um, you know, if you're using something like cluster JDBC. Um, so. And I guess that's probably it myself. Right. Yeah, I think JDBC driver and or database handle all of that. It's invisible to the Hibernate layer. Right. Yeah, and if not, then yes. I mean, that, that is the use case for shards. So you could use Hibernate shards, but uh, that's not really actively maintained anymore, I don't really think. You know, one question that I just remembered is from Jay, um, and he was specifically asking about, is there any thought given to the new API redesign in Hibernate 4 specifically to making it easier to work with dynamic languages like Groovy and all the other popular dynamic languages on the JVM these days? Um, well, I mean, I've not... I've not heard of any like difficulties with it, so it's kind of hard to to design. I mean, if you, especially with Groovy, I know a lot of people specifically talked about the um, the Hibernate's notion of entity modes. So Hibernate has um, a map entity mode. So instead of instead of writing classes, um, which we call the the POJO entity mode, you can actually just represent you know have Hibernate represent your data as maps of maps of maps of maps. Um, so, you know, you, you would get a customer map of data, you know, and like his addresses or their addresses would be a collection of maps inside that map. Um, and, you know, I know a lot of, a lot of um, dynamic languages are built on top of that particular entity mode, so they don't even need, you know, the notion of a, of a class um, specifically to represent that. Now, one of the things that we did that I would like to do um, there, there is some cleanup that's, that's being discussed right now in regards to entity mode. Like we might get rid of the DOM4J entity mode because um, it doesn't really work right now, and it's, it's kind of, in my opinion, it's kind of a broken concept anyway. Um, I, I think that there's better ways to deal with, with getting a DOM structure, um, you know, by, by passing in like a, a notion of a marshaller and unmarshaller to hibernate and asking it to, to just deal with stuff. Um, and we may, you know, come back to that as, as you know, a martial, unmartial kind of concept. But I would like to add another entity mode, which is a sort of proxy entity mode. So you'd actually get, you'd supply Hibernate with an interface for your entity. And then behind the scenes, it would just take care of, like, building a map to hold all the data and, and you know, routing the, the method calls on the interface to get the uh, you know, to get the correct data and, and set stuff up correctly and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, per, that might actually be, be useful in, a, in a, um, a dynamic environment too. There's one interest. There's also some questions from people who are just asking what I'd call general Hibernate questions, and specifically one about the Hibernate dirty check. You know, how does Hibernate know that something does need to be updated? And apparently, this gentleman Vincat here believes that um, Hibernate is updating tables where there are no changes to the data. Have you seen any specific issues, or you you know, any areas of optimization there that you can think of off the top of your head? I mean, if, if that's what you're seeing, then enter a Jira, but. You know, I mean, we can't fix something if we don't know that it's not, if we don't know it's there. But that's a problem, you know. If it, if nothing really changed and and you didn't ask it to, you know, to force a write and and it's doing it anyway, then that's a, you know, that's a problem. And uh, one about specifically around Hibernate four. You know, what can you speak to connection pooling? What is anything changing in the connection pooling? Related to Hibernate 4? Um, yes and no. I mean, we we added another. 
let me backtrack. If they're talking about the built-in connection pooling, no, that's still not supported. I mean, that's, that's just something that, that's still just intended for, you know, just testing and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we still totally recommend that you, you use a third-party connection pool and just integrate it via the, the connection provider interface that I, that I mentioned before as a, as a service. Um, now, connection provider is a service now in Hibernate 4, um, so it makes it much easier to, you know, to, to plug in your own. Um, out of the box, we you know we support um, integration with C3P0 and Proxul um, as connection pools, and we may add you know we used to a long time ago support DBCP, and we may actually add support for DBCP back into um, into Hibernate. Um, now there is a new kind of parallel interface to support multi-tenancy. Um, Specifically, where it's you know separate database and/or separate instance, um, you know tip, a typical approach to that is that you'd have um, different data sources, um, you know, so you'd have like you know a, a base name for your data sources, JDI name, and then like you know the last little piece would be you know which which particular tenant that uh, connection is for, um, and so we needed a way, an easy way to be able to um, to deal with that in an API, and you know, I couldn't really come up with a clean way to do that in the existing connection provider um, interface, and so we just created a new one um, that's kind of in parallel to that. So you have either or, um, but again, that's specifically to, to support multi-tenancy. Um, so hopefully that answers the answers the question. And you mentioned the shards earlier, so uh, Varun, uh, hopefully I pronounced that name correctly, was asking, well, what's going on with shards, and is it a lost cause? Um, I, honestly, I don't really know. I don't know what's going on with it. Um, I, I think that, you know, I think that the, uh, the people that originally contributed it, um, you know, don't really, you know, they don't keep up with it out there anymore, so I think that it's, it's not developed really anymore. I mean, yeah, we were, never, we were never able to get it to be enterprise supportable, so it's just right. been out dot org, and um, I think his name was Max over at Google, right? Max right. and um, one of them, yeah. There was a couple of them, a couple of uh, guys from Google, basically were were doing that. Other good questions, though, related to um, like X, you know, is Hibernate going to handle XML column types? And I'm not sure where that question comes from. I thought there was some support for that already, but maybe you can speak to you know, XML column types in the database? Um, well, that's another big change with Hibernate 4, actually, that I forgot to mention, is that um, it's, it's baselined on JDK 6, JDK 1.6. Um, so we do have, you know, we will be able to um, rely on JDBC 4 being there. Um, JDBC 4 does, de you know, does define the XML data type. Um, I haven't done any specific support for it yet because, quite honestly, I mean, I haven't really seen a um, a feature request for it, so I don't, I'm not sure exactly what that would look like. Um, but if you have, you know, ideas, please, please add them. But we did add support for, you know, there is support now for, actually, I take that back. I haven't added it yet, but there's, in, in the Alpha 3 that's coming out um, in two more weeks, there will be support for nationalized character sets. So things like NCLOB, um, NVARCAR, things like that, um, which is uh, you know another new feature with JDBC4 um, will be in there. So um, you know, yeah, whoever asked the question, if uh, you know, if you could do a feature request of what exactly it is that you're looking for there, um, you know, we can we can consider that. And there's one question here I really really love from Fred. Uh, he specifically said, "How does Foro?" affect the old to ORM or not to ORM question? Because um, that is a question we've seen in the community, a great debate. You know, uh, we had some backlash, if you will, from object relational mapping standpoint and, and the use of object relational mapping technology. Does Harmony 4 make things easier, smoother, cleaner, more performant? You know, I think that's really where Fred's question is trying to go. Um, does it really swing um, that over to yeah. um, you know, It's basically... There's there's a there's a, a bigger vision is, is is you know let me let me start it off that way. There's a bigger vision here, which is um, 
you know, changing some core things, changing core things in how Hibernate does them. Um, the first one was this, you know, this notion of splitting up um, services and metadata that I talked about in the very beginning. Um, it's really limiting in, in terms of how Hibernate does stuff at startup time because of, because of how that, that configuration object worked before. And so, you know, the major push of, of 4.0 was to change that because it was the big, you know, number one, it's the biggest, it, it's the first thing that, that causes problems. And then number two, it's also the biggest um, API change because, um, you know, there's, there's lots of changes. I mean, it's, you know, configuration probably won't be there anymore. Um, if it is there, it's going to act very different semantically. Um, so th there's, there's a lot of, of critical pathness there. Um, so that, that was why we decided to attack that one first. Um, you know, further down the road, there's, you know, a bunch of changes we want to do in terms of how Hibernate generates um, SQL and um, and that will um, have yeah that will have a lot of, of impact in terms of um, you know obviously how it talks to to the database and and giving it an opportunity to be much more performant. I mean it's very you know Hibernate's I, I haven't seen numbers in a real application that show Hibernate not being performant um, right now, but um, you know the, this will give us an opportunity to, to you know to squeeze out even more performance. By changing, uh, you know, fetching strategies and stuff like that on the fly. Um, so, anyway. Um, hey, another question I saw from Kevin here that I, I also really like, um, and I'm also personally curious about. It's related to the dirty property detection, specifically within the context of a session. You know, how do I know what changed? Um, he specifically says the Hibernate eventing API or event API is tricky to deal with, or very tricky to deal with for collections. Um, and he also wants to know more about Enverse, right, the entity versioning. How does it right. know what changed? And I've personally had that problem in projects that I've worked on. You know, we really want to know what things changed so we can either respond back to the user to say, hey, are you sure you're sure you, these are the things that need to be dumped and canceled or really need to change? Or, you know, you're just trying to build an audit log or something like that, or audit trail. Um, mm -hmm. Can you speak to that point and what might be different in Hibernate 4? <clears throat> Um, well, this is so this is one of the things that will it, it's it's not really changing in Hibernate 4.0, but it's yeah definitely one of the things we want to change. Um, Hibernate grew up with this notion of parallel arrays. I, I don't know another. I mean, unfortunately, I think there's a feature now in in JDK either either six or seven that that takes on that same kind of term. It has to do with um, with uh, doing stuff con concurrently, I believe. But anyway. It's always the term I've used to to, to describe, um, you know, a standard way Hibernate does stuff internally. But it keeps like multiple arrays, and then you're expected to kind of go through the arrays by index in parallel. So, for example, you know, index index zero in this array matches up to index zero in this other array matches up to index zero in this third array, and you just kind of have to know that they all match up. Which is kind of stuff that you know I want to wanted to get away from. Um, so in the eventing API, this exposes itself because you get a bunch of these raw arrays and, and you know just you expected to just kind of know what's happened. But yeah, we would like to uh, you know like to change that so there's an actual you know API over it to say you know this is what changed and and, and so on and so forth. Um, Envers, yeah, Envers does exactly what I just described. It looks through all of the all of the arrays and, and just you know knows how to how to seek out the stuff that that has changed. Um, it handles it for for collections and, and all that stuff as well. So it's I mean it's doable. You just kind of have to know what you're doing, um, which is obviously why we want an API over it. So you don't. You know, it's the, the same exact notion of, a, of of direction. You know, directing directing the developer as to you know here's here's the stuff you you need to look at, um, as opposed to just here's everything. You know, now go find it. So we're we're at the top of. Um, we've been at this for one hour, but there are probably a couple other questions I think that would be good to address. And um, people want to know specifically: Is there any adjustments to Hibernate validators? Any improvements? Any any specific changes in that area? Um, I, I, 
to tell you the truth, I'm not really sure about Validator. It, um, you know, it's kind of been um, discontinued um, in, in, in preference of the, the Bean Validation spec and doing stuff through Bean Validation. Because um, there was a, you know, there was a legacy Hibernate Validator, um, and so that, that um, you know, the, the spec actually grew out of that, but, you know, it, it's kind of, that, that's kind of not really being developed anymore, and, and all the effort's going into, into the Bean Validation RI. And, and that's the reason I asked the question as well, because I'm also curious, because I know we had the beam validation specification uh, that Emmanuel Bernard led, um, and there's more work going on there. Maybe that's where we'll see more of that going forward. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the um, yeah, we've we've dropped the integration in 4.0 for the legacy um, legacy stuff, the the automatic stuff. I mean, if you if you want to continue to use the legacy things, you know, it's just a bunch of event listeners, so you can plug in, you know. A, a, you know, plug in the event listeners yourself, but this auto automatic auto wiring of it um, is is no longer there in Hibernate 4. It, it does the beam validation stuff. And one thing I'm particularly excited about when it, as it relates to beam validation is if you make those declarative validations on the domain model, uh, one of the things we're doing now at Rich Races 4 is it will actually migrate or be inherited by the browser itself. So those those actual um, Domain model validations will be exposed as JavaScript validations if you want that to be if you want that to happen, which is pretty neat if you think about it. You know, if you're looking at mandatory fields or fields that meet a certain format, things of that nature, that's actually pretty nice. Yeah. Um, how about one last question? And I think it's on everybody's mind. And then but we're over the hour. You know, with all these big changes, what do you think about from a migration standpoint? I'm a Hibernate 3 user today. Let's say Hibernate 3.5, Hibernate 3.6, et cetera. What is it going to mean for me to migrate to this four, this four world? Um, you know, it actually, I don't think it'll be very much. Um, it, it depends. It really kind of depends what you're using. If you're using, you know, what's always been exposed as, as a public API and what's always been touted as a public API, there won't really be that much of a change. I mean, yeah, you have to change the way you build a session factory. Um, but you know that's you know that's always been intended to be a you know a one time kind of thing for your application, so that should be you know a couple lines of code um, you know it, yeah you have to change how you build a session um, depending upon which you know which options for opening a session you used you know but like I said, we kept one or two i'd have to you know again I'd have to go look at the at the code um, but we kept like you know the the one or two most common ways to open a session directly on session factory and they just delegate to that to that with options method but if you're doing you know if you're passing in you know manual connect like one of the things that we really wanted to, to get away from is this idea of um, session factory dot open session here's a JDBC connection right um, that, that kind of that kind of stuff just causes all kinds of problems and so we wanted to, to get away from that. So that's like softly deprecated. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're using something like that, um, or you're using some of the other um, overloaded methods of open session, um, you know, yeah, you will have to change to use this, this new API. And you may want to anyway. I mean, it's just, a, in my personal opinion, it's just a cleaner way to do it. Um, and yeah, it's a change, but you know, it is. Um, but other than that, you know, unless if you're doing like integration kind of stuff, you might have to change some things. Um, in my again, in my personal opinion, if you're doing things like event listeners, Hibernate 4 has some really cool stuff. You know, I didn't touch all the all the new features in, in Hibernate 4, but if you're doing event listeners, Hibernate 4 has this has this new um, service locator kind of thing where you can you know, you know it's it's based on the the standard JDK um, 1.6. Um, feature where you can actually have a properties file in your meta inf directory that names an implementation of, of a particular um, interface, a service interface. Um, Hibernate understands all that, and it, it can actually go out and automatically, you know, integrate all of your listeners for you. Um, so, you know, that kind of stuff, I think, makes it a lot easier. You don't have to manually do all that sort of stuff anymore. Um, so anyway, there, there's, there's lots of things. I don't think that the changes will be really all that drastic, um, aside from, you know, building a session factory and opening a session. Other than that, you know, pretty much everything stays the same. 
And, um, and with that, I think we have to bring things to a close because we're over our hour and therefore over our quota. But, Steve, thank you very much for a very informative session, and I really enjoy your sessions. They're very interactive, and I think our audience likes that. We get to a lot of questions in your sessions. Some of our sessions we do, we don't get to any questions hardly because there's just too much content. And um, for the, we're going to gather up these questions, and I'll hand them back to Steve at the end of the session. He normally publishes those someplace for the ones he wants to kind of create an FAQ out of. And... Um, um, and, and one thing I would encourage you guys to do for, you know, we had hundreds of people on the line today. You guys heard more about Hibernate 4. You now know it's out there. We'd encourage you to go look at it, download what we have out there today, see what's going on in JIRA. We love it when you guys go look at the roadmap in JIRA and, and think about what's happening when. And specifically, uh, you know, you can put additional issues in there uh, if you find bugs, et cetera. Please, please feel free to do that. As part of the community, we need you guys to participate and encourage you guys to do so. And then if you guys have other questions, feel free to hit us on IRC or the mailing list as you see listed here. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. You all showing up.